It is another Magic Monday here at the hey, Overrun. Ed Bowder and Dan Schwester, and we look the same as we did last week because Danny is in France right now. <laughs> so while he's over there exploring the great European culture, and I'm sure eating many things with butter, we are going to be discussing airway management for EMS. So let's jump right into it. We'll get into this study we're talking about that comes from Jeff Jarvis et al. So this came out in April of last year. This is evidence-based guidelines for pre-hospital airway management. Now, before we get into the discussion of this article, this is important because this is one of the first papers that came out that said, this is what the evidence says and what we should do. And, yeah. you know, and Jarvis and his whole crew, Darren Brody, and I'll pull up all the authors so they can see them a lot here. Of on uh, this a lot of all-stars, a couple friends of the show. So <clears throat> this came out and again, all basic stuff you would anticipate. Airway management is a cornerstone of emergency medical care. They talk about the project and how they're working. Uh, they created the Agency for Healthcare Resources and Quality, and it's all an expert panel review. So first thing that I wanna shout out because he's another friend of the show, one of the first reported US civilian field endotracheal innovations was performed in the early 1970s by John Moon, a paramedic with a Freedom House Ambulance Project in Pittsburgh. Uh, so shout out to John Moon for that. And so th this is a very technical paper. It's kind of wordy. Um, so we're just going to go in through some of the tables. So we'll check out this first table. This is table two, recommendations for airway management during pre-hospital arrest. So looking at this, Dan, the first thing that stuck out to us was in all of the columns in this study, they show certainty of evidence, and it tends to all look the same. We tend to all see very low, 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 moderate, and all of that. So first, let's, we'll, we'll talk about that while we have this spreadsheet up for everyone yeah. to see. But Part of the reason and, and part of the problems with this data set and, you know, conversations have been had off the air with some of the authors of this paper as well, where the, one of the principal problems here is, and, and we've talked on the show where, you know, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, right? But right. one of the problems with pre-hospital papers is that there's not a lot of them. Not a lot of them and not a lot of evidence to back anything up. Yeah. So this is one of the limitations and one of the challenges that I think the authors had for this, this uh, overview is that we think this stuff works, but I, we have no statistical basis to say it does work. Yeah, and that's, that's not a function of these things don't work. It tends to, I think it's a more of a function of the, the data just hasn't been put out yet, You're right? right? So again, if, if there's a, a sub a secondary catchphrase for everything that we're doing, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Yeah. So what they recommend here during cardiac arrest, which at this point shouldn't be a surprise to everybody, we suggest either BVM or supraglottic airway may be used for airway management with, for adults with out of hospital cardiac arrest, right? Conditional recommendation. We suggest that either a BVM alone or ETI may be used in airway management for adults with, uh, with out of hospital cardiac arrest. Now, what I want to point out is the certainty of this evidence is low and the certainty of the BVM is very low. So right. <clears throat> when the, what they did, and one of the things that I like about this paper is they found the data and then they said, we think this is probably what's, what is best. We think this is what works. Right. So in adult out of hospital cardiac arrest, we suggest in favor of SGI over ETI for airway management and cardiac arrest without demonstrated high ETI proficiency. Uh, and again, conditional recommendation, low to moderate, and essentially showing the same thing, we, we suggest uh, supraglottic airways over endotracheal intubation for pediatric patients as yeah, well. And listen, and listen to what they're saying here. They're saying, what they're saying makes a lot of sense. If you're in a service that is not really proficient with endotracheal intubation, if you yeah. don't get a lot of tubes, if you don't practice it, and you don't have a lot of medical director oversight and a good QI, QA, QI process, like we've talked about on this show a lot of times, you probably shouldn't be doing that intubation. Yeah. However, I, we don't have studies that have randomized people to supraglottic airway or a tracheal right. tube. And the ones that we do, we have a little bit of data, but we don't, we certainly don't have the, uh, just the amount that would back up something that they could say like, yeah, yeah, do this. And, and again, I think a lot of the stuff we do in EMS tends to be based on feel, um, where it's, you know, I, well, I like, uh, whatever I like IO over IV because I feel like I have better access or, you know, to the, to the counterpoint, you'll have people who say like, well, I prefer starting an IV in cardiac arrest over an IO because that's what I know, or that's what I'm comfortable with. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's going to be hard to get these data sets, because even if you try 
to you know blind or randomize a, a study, you're still going to have providers who are going to be like, no, I'm going to do it the way that I want to do it. Um, <clears throat> I think for cardiac arrest, because uh, again, and you know, we talked last week about this. You know, I feel like we had this conversation 15 years ago, <laughs> and you know, it, it's it's. We keep having these conversations, but yeah. nobody studies it. Nobody right. wants to put data on the paper, and we need people to research. We need organizations to research. We need organizations with strong airway backgrounds to do the numbers and mm -hmm. crunch it and say, hey, look, in our system, when we do this, this is what we're seeing, and we yeah. need it to be replicated. Well, and that's why we have to we have to keep giving big shout outs to like the people at ESO and you know the Jeff Jarvis's Absolutely. and Remley Crows of the world who are actually look, taking the time to look into this. Um, as far as the practice is concerned, because I, I, I remember the first time I heard that a supraglottic airway and an IO in cardiac arrest is sufficient, and mm -hmm. I I don't think that it's worthwhile to throw out the good in pursuit of the perfect. Right, we we are not going to save every cardiac arrest. I mean, shit, we don't, we barely even save ten percent of cardiac arrests, but. We're, like we're just not going to save 100% of cardiac arrest. So once we accept that, and then we start finding like, all right, how can we try to maximize the survival and the performance in out of hospital cardiac arrest? And because there's no definitive answer, and I think you know part of the human condition is we want definitive answers. Sure. It's it's difficult to kind of reconcile that. But I, I remember when I first heard about all this data, and in my practice, I started using superglottics and IOs. Uh, in cardiac arrest. And I got to tell you, man, it, it seems to move smoother, you know, with, with a superglottic airway, whether, and, you know, I, back in our day when we were using combi tubes, um, I think it was a bit different, but, you know, in, in our practice, or in my practice, I remember moving from the combi tube to the King tube to, you know, the, the LMA to an eye gel and, you know, the eye gels, whatever, I'm not here whoring for a product, but I, they work. They, like, they just do. So I, I mean, sorry. But we would if you if intersurgical wants to help us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you want to give us money, we'll take it from you. Um, <laughs> but it, it 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 just works. It's it's just a product that works. Now that said, the king tubes also worked. Like I'm not, you know, eye gels probably work a little better than king tubes. But I think the point is in cardiac arrest, you need to have an airway. I don't know that it matters what type of airway you have. So we have that, right? We'll look at the trauma things. Again, same thing, BVM or SGA for trauma, SGA or ETI for trauma, right? We, we just don't know. Very low, low, very low, low. And again, right? that we'll means move not, again, guys, that gang, that means not a lot of data to support either side. We don't yep. have it. There's a few right. studies here and there that have done this and they have some conclusions, but again, if we want to have a high level of recommendations for this stuff, you need to replicate these studies over and over and over again yeah. to show they're, they're, that the trend <clears throat> makes sense. Yeah. And we've said it dozens of times where it, any good study will end saying that there needs to be more research on this topic. This is one of the, the tables I thought was interesting. This is table five recommendations for airway management of patients using uh, technique modifiers which this is essentially, these are medical patients, right? So this is recommendations right. for airway management using uh, technique modifiers here. In patients requiring intubation, we chose not to make a recommendation concerning intubation with sedation only compared to the use of no medications due to the particularly uncertain nature of the supporting evidence. So here again, they recommend RSI, <clears throat> um, if you need a medication assisted airway, uh, over, over sedation without paralysis. Uh, and if you need to do RSI, uh, you know, fine, but only if you have high functioning settings. So Again, this data says like you can, we sh you should use RSI for patients that need airway management that, you know, medical airway management. However, if you're bad at it, you should use another thing. And I, and, I, I and think that that's right. common sense, right? Yeah. This, this makes all the sense in the world. If you're really good at, if you're in a place where you're really good at intubation, you practice it on a regular basis, you will see patients requiring intubation, you have robust protocols to support your, your practice, and you have, you have a, I hate to say it because people hate it, but you have a high-functioning uh, clinical department with a QAQI process that is going mm -hmm. to hold you responsible for your actions on scenes and check with right. you when things didn't go well or check with you when they did go well, you're probably not going to be successful at this all the time. And, you know, it stands to reason common sense tells us 
is it is it better for the patient to put in an eye gel or supraglottic airway and have one attempt and have a good airway that'll work or do do three or four attempts at intubation from somebody right. who hasn't tubed maybe all a year I, you know i don't know you know we do need randomized control trials but again this is common sense stuff folks mm -hmm. you know and th th one of the best things about it i think is there's always a concern of skill attrition Mm -hmm. Right. It, 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 I, I feel like it's one of the first things I hear whenever I hear like, oh, well, we should use supraglottic airways. We should use eye gels, whatever. And my response to that tends to be like, I don't really care if you're losing a skill that doesn't work in the first place. Hmm. Right now in, in our systems, we're, we're kind of lucky, right? I mean, we, in our, in our areas, we intubate, I, I mean, multiple times a day in some cases. <laughs> Sometimes, um, yeah. Yeah, and it's, and it's always it's and it's always your chart. You ever notice that? It's like if you're going to intimate <laughs> several people, it's it's never like oh we'll split it. You know, my partner has one, I have one. No, it's either I have to write always four one. four always four arrest chart. charts, and my partner has triages and RMAs. But um, but either way, it, if you're not good at intubating, I think that it, there's a moment where you have to kind of acknowledge that and swallow your pride a little bit because you can still fix and treat the patient as much as you want to. If yeah. you use a supraglottic airway like that, that's, it's, it's sure. just there. So, and if we're not really sure of that, because, you know, we, we try and come prepared to these things. Here's another data set that talks about supraglottic airways. Uh, and this is, this is from uh, Tanner Smida. And this is again from 2002. Um, that was a good, good segue. And, like that. Yeah. So again, this whole thing, while various supraglottic airways are available for out of hospital cardiac arrest, comparisons of patient outcomes by device are limited. In this study, we aim to compare outcomes of out of hospital cardiac arrest patients who had airway management by EMS with the IGEL or King LT. So this last study we showed said, you know what, if you if intubation is uh, too difficult to do, or if you're not particularly skilled at it, or if you know, you, you don't do it a lot, whatever, eye gels, supraglottic airways, whatever, are perfectly sufficient, right? Now, again, we don't have a lot of data for it, but we do have data that suggests that this is probably better. This paper came out before the last paper. So <clears throat> what they did at ESO is over three years, they did a retrospective study, right? And we're going to just kind of mow through this because it's all kind of stuff we've talked about before. Huge end for this, 286,192 out of hospital cardiac arrest patients, 93,866 patients eligible for inclusion. All right, and here we go through all this. And patients who received a supraglottic airway used the eye gel was not associated with significantly greater survival. Among patients who received a supraglottic device's rescue airway or failed intubation, used the eye gel was associated with greater odds of survival discharge to home. So these are two sentences that seem to contradict each other, but essentially if you're giving this patient a supraglottic airway, you're giving them an eye gel. The eye gel itself, just using that airway is not independently associated with imp increased outcomes. Now, they don't go into why, but I, I tend to imagine in these cardiac arrest data sets that you have to keep in mind the best cardiac arrest survival number I've ever seen holistically in a system is 12%. Now, there's the Medic One project out in Seattle who's, who touts over like 55%, but they don't count asystole. So, uh, you know... I, I, yeah, when, that, they, when, kind they, of a, when they pump those numbers, when they do their numbers, and they're a great high functioning system, they're a fantastic absolutely. system. Yeah, but they look and, at and, witness VFVT arrests, big difference. Right, big and difference. and no no hate towards Seattle and Medic One, they've done no, you know no, we, they they they've done work that is going to make a difference for decades. And absolutely, you know, I, I, yeah. I have I have a lot of respect for them. But if you're looking at their data set, fifty five percent cardiac arrest survivability, survivability sounds awesome, but you know. It, it, it'd be like saying a sports team didn't really, you know, they're, they're, they're winning a hundred percent of the games. They don't lose. And you're like, <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, <laughs> you know, um, but essentially the conclusion for here, right. In this data set, the use of the eye gel during out of hospital cardiac arrest resuscitation was associated with overall better outcomes compared to the use of the King LT. Now, this is looking at again, eye gel versus King. This, if you've seen one paper, you've seen one paper, blah, blah, blah. But using the data that we see kind of holistically, right? We see that, all right, we, we know that we have these options between these two devices because I'm not convinced anyone's really using combi tubes anymore. If they no. are, my condolences, but if you are, whatever. So we have these two devices. Made anymore. I, even better. So, so, but if you're using one of these two devices, it seems like maybe the IGEL works better than the King tube, but they both are, 
you're using an airway for a patient who's moribund in the first place. So, you know, you have to wonder like, what is their potential to survive anyway? But writ large, when we're thinking about airway management, I think that for a long time in EMS, we've talked so much about, you know, intubation is the gold standard. And it is, I'm not, I'm not taking away from intubation or the skill of intubation, especially not in the hospital. But I worry that we focus so much on the sexy skills, right? Where like, I can intubate someone hanging from my toes, upside down, suspended over the Grand Canyon with my eyes closed. And you're like, that's terrific. But if you, if the patient, you know, died 45 minutes ago, ah, good, good for you, you know? So I, I think seeing these, these data sets and saying like, you can use a superglottic airway and here's a study that says that superglottic airways work fine, all things considered, is a way to, to think about moving the practice forward or a way to think about how we can actually start treating people in this arena. Yeah, I, I, I thought that was interesting. I, I kind of looked at it from another perspective. I, I looked at it from, look, I think it's fairly commonsensical to say open airways are good, occluded airways are bad. Um, yep. How you get there probably doesn't matter. But again, as talking about the earlier paper, we don't have any balance of data that, that will statistically support that. But from, again, common sense and how we think things work makes it, it kind of, it, it kind of works. Well, um, what's the anecdote? Is it what, like water, water, spit, spit? You don't have an airway. You don't have something that rhymes with spit. <laughs> That was the old, that was that old thing, you know, and, and they're right. You know, why do you think we've, we move forward with uh, front of neck access and crites and things like that? Because if you don't have an airway, you have a dead patient. You will not change right. that. That has not changed since the dawn of time, since the beginning of medicine, the beginning of EMS, it's ever since chief moon first intimated that patient, cause that's what he had. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, if he didn't have an airway, you, de you definitely don't have a viable patient. Now, here's the thing that gets me, and this is what I want to. This is where I want to kind of start going with things, and I want to put in the uh, put in your, you know, if you're listening to this, I want to put in your head this little idea that this study came out in 2002, right? 22, 22, 2022. Oh, 22. Okay, all right. That's a that's a big different thing. Um, you know, we're going to get to a point with a lot of these well, studies. No, because no, Weingarten Levitan came out in 2011. Right. So we're going like, like that. That, that, that's, that seminal paper came out 11 years before this one did. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I, so, I, I, you know, I just wonder how all these things are going. You know, we this data, it's going to get stale. You know what I mean? That's what I were mm -hmm. like. Eventually it's going to get stale. That's why we need more data. That's why we need more stuff. And that's why things like, I want to give a shout out to ESO because if you don't know about ESO, you really should look into it and go to Google and go to their website, uh, Google Remley Crow and follow her because she has done probably the most stuff on EMS. One of the, one of the leaders of EMS research and she's, you know, they, they collect an enormous amount of data and make it available to anybody to actually use and study the stuff that they can find. They pulled out tons of stuff. They, they can, you can pull out anything from their data set. It is so amazing. Um, and a lot of it, you know, granted retrospective, but sure. you can't, you can't doubt these numbers, right? And what's important about it is that they're available. So if you're, if you're in a project, if you're working for a project that isn't being driven by data, Google ESO solutions. Like they, they have it. They, right? they aside do. from like, uh, aside from like the content that we put out and the stuff that everyone else is putting out in, in the FOMED world, you can just Google this stuff and then you can take a data set and show it to your leadership. If you think about, if you can imagine it, ESO probably has a data set that'll work for it. Yeah. And they've, they've given brilliant presentations on it. And also, at, at least in, in our experience, I can say, Danny, they're, they're all more than happy to talk oh, about their data yeah. and to talk about the information. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It's Matter not, of fact, we should probably you know, they, get back on to talk about research in the near future. Yeah, right. Um, like it, 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 they're not cagey about it. And this is the stuff that they, they really like. It's what they, they enjoy doing. Yeah. Um, but we definitely, you know, need, and it, you know, we definitely need to continue doing research and, Everybody can do research. Um, right. It's not hard to do. You can get guidance from it. 
Um, even little, even little studies make a difference. Even if it doesn't get published yep. in a peer reviewed dur- journal, even if it's a poster presentation, it still counts. It still moves the, the profession forward because somebody right. will have that data, but we can't do it unless we start doing research on a regular basis. And every agency needs to be doing their research. And everything is computerized now. So you, you, you can, yeah. you can, it might be work, but you can do it. The one thing that I want to end on is I think a lot of this, when you start seeing a lot of data that feels contradictory, it's very easy to kind of lose hope a little bit and kind of get apathetic and say like, well, I'm just going to do what I've always done because in 15 years, what I'm doing is going to be the new stuff anyway. Right. Because people will say like, it's comforting. Yeah. Well, well, because people will say like, oh, look, mass trousers are coming back into, into the mainstream. And so the assumption is that like, well, we were always doing it the right way 30 years ago. And my, my only message is like to not, to not lose, uh, you know, the admiration you have for the practice to not, you know, to not keep being curious. Um, and you know, to it, it, science is a, is a very dynamic field, you know, things move and things change and, you know, you got to work not to get discouraged at it, but we are starting to find things that can actually make patients much better and, you know, not for nothing. It also kind of makes our job easier. Um, sure. you know, I, I can, I can say as far as a skill set, I would much rather start a superquatic airway than have to go through an intubation. Um, you know, and I, I, I enjoy airway management, but I mean, you know, in the back of a truck at two o'clock in the morning, uh, an eye gel works perfectly fine, but I, I, this interesting data sets, important studies, let us know what you guys think down in the comments, be sure to subscribe on YouTube and listen to the Overrun podcast, wherever you get your podcasts for today's magic Monday journal club. I am Ed Bowder. Yeah, I'm Dan Schwester. And oh, I'm Dan Schwester. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Safe travels, Danny. Thank you all for listening. We'll talk to you all next week.